Matthew 22, 1 to 14. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away. One, of his far one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out to the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When, uh, when Rennie uh, got the preview of the reading for this week, he said, you've done it to me again. You've given me a hard one, uh, one that uh, has a lot of um, bad things in it happening, all that kind of stuff. And it is. This is a tough one. This is one. Uh, you, I, first off, before I um, go into it, I, I want to remind you that Jesus was talking in parables here. In other words, um, he was a storyteller. He was a very, very good storyteller. And oftentimes when he would tell stories, there would be exaggerations and there would be, you know, uh, huge consequences and things like that. Uh, you would hear more gnashing of teeth and, and, and things like that. Uh, just like we read books today, we uh, uh, watch movies, we see, you know, that have a, an underlying theme to it. That's what Jesus was doing. Uh, he was the, uh, doing the, the, the entertainment of that day of uh, relating to people. But it's something that nobody walks away from this story feeling 100% good. Uh, when you start out this story, it sounds like what he's saying is that, you know, those that refuse Jesus, you know, they, they, they've been invited to the wedding, but the, the unbelievers, you know, they have refused time and time again. So the, the uh, owner of the, 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 the wedding banquet goes out, has his people go out and, and find other people, people in the streets, people that are, it says, even good and bad. And so the, the way you think that this story is leading is that, okay, those rich snobs, you know, they're not going to get in, but we're, we're all okay. And then, and then right in the middle there, just toward, it just kind of turns. It says that the, the, the host sees somebody that's not in their, uh, their, their, their wedding garment, you know, and questions them. And the person says, I don't know. And then... He binds him, ties him, gnashing of teeth. It's not a good outcome for this guy, this guy that's been invited to the wedding. And so a lot of people look at this and they think, what is that all about? Here's, here's the Jesus you know, followers, and they're all in there and everything like that. But why did he make that point of doing that little switcheroo there? That doesn't make me feel very, very good. What he's talking about there is... That even among the believers, he's reminding them that we can still, we can still mess up. That in, in, in times there are people that will refuse to follow Jesus. But then there's the ones that say that they do, but their actions say that they don't. And that's what he's really kind of pointing out. He's playing to both crowds there. He's talking to the Pharisees and the religious leaders that have been criticizing them all along. 
But then at the end of the story, he turns to his own disciples and gives them a little bit of a warning that you're called, which means you've got to watch yourself too. The, the robe that he's talking about is, the, is almost like the, uh, the, the commitment, the behavior that we talk about, the, the morals. You know, it's funny. We have been called a lot of things when we started this church. Um, you, you, you start a church, and uh, some people have a problem with that right off the bat. They think, they think there's too many, and other churches you know, don't like it. And, and then when you say that you're inclusive, um, you get labeled as uh, a church that has no morals, and anything goes. Um, but we're just in a free-for-all spiral, you know, uh, saying everything's okay. I hope I've never, I hope I've never made that message come across. Because to me, our church has a very high regard to mor morals and values. It's what leads us, it's what makes us inclusive, are those morals, those Christ-followed morals. Um, this weekend, I, I pretended I was young again. <laughs> and it didn't work out. Um, Saturday, uh, Allison, I don't know if, you, uh, if everyone knows Allison. This is my wife, Allison, right here. Uh, she, she, this is the, yeah. Everywhere she goes, she gets applause. You know, just, that's just, just the nature of just how great she is. <laughs> when she comes home, I clap. Because if I don't, she beats me. So that's the, yeah. But we, Saturday, we went to uh, Screamers. Huh? Friday, Friday went to Screamers. That's the, the one downtown, uh, and they went to a show. It was a classic R&B, and right back there, Mr. Billy right there, sang his face off and burnt the place to the ground. It was just amazing what he did there. They did a show that made me tired. I mean, just, just watching it. And he, for every song, I don't remember how many you sang, a new jacket. I mean, he just, he, there, was, there was clothing changes and just, it was showmanship and it was just a whole bunch of stuff. And um, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. I, I recommend that show to, to, to everybody. Um, and then Saturday, I went and saw Will at Art and Soul and got to see, uh, Will did a complete set of uh, original songs. And I'm telling you, there are very few songwriters that can do what Will can do, uh, as far as putting words together. Um, he did a song, um, Whirlwind of Butterflies, brand new, never heard it before, and it, it, he talked about just, how he was... Uh, driving home and saw a bunch of butterflies, and suddenly there's a song. I would have been looking for windshield wiper fluid, but <laughs> that's all I would have gotten out of it. But I used to be a little bit in the, uh, the, the, the music biz, in a sense. I was a DJ. That. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's... <laughs> why. <laughs> I don't know what gets more of a laugh, that picture, the way I look now. I don't know what you're, I'm not sure what you're laughing at, but that was me. It was the, I, I was um, in radio at the time. This was the um, uh, early to mid-90s, I think. I, I was younger. So you young people, this is coming for you. <laughs> I was doing radio at the, uh, um, I was, um, I spent many evenings uh, at concerts talking with, uh, uh, hobnobbing with uh, uh, musicians and band leaders and all of that kind of stuff, announcing shows. And then when I wasn't doing that, occasionally I was doing uh, stand-up comedy still. And uh, my job in the morning 
was to basically do comedy in the morning. It was um, uh, kind of like an ad lib show where you took the calls and you just, your job was to be funny from 6 a.m. until uh, 10 o'clock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it should have been the happiest time of my life. Doing comedy, being paid to be a smart aleck. That's what my job was. Um, going places and being treated, believe it or not, like a celebrity. I, I've signed autographs before with this. I know, laugh it up. <laughs> but I was miserable at this time. This, this moment would lead me down a road that eventually would make me question taking my own life. And I always wanted to be an entertainer. I always wanted to be a comedian. I love comedy. I've always had that uh, kind of passion. I should have been enjoying this. But I wasn't. I looked like I did. You know, most people um, that are uh, insecure, insecure is when you really question and don't like yourself very much. You're the worst critic of anybody. But we can, we can make a face like that when the camera's on, you know. But I was very insecure, always struggled with that, always, always struggled with it. I would meet somebody, and uh, within five minutes of talking to them, I would convince myself they hate me, you know, they don't like me. Um, I was doing, when I was doing stand-up, I'd, I'd be uh, performing in front of 200 people, and uh, I would have uh, people laughing. And then if there was one person that wasn't, that's who I went home thinking about. And I was always scared that I was going to wake up and not, not be funny anymore, not be good anymore, and not be liked anymore. And you do things when you're that insecure, you try to medicate as best you can. But you know what? Very seldomly do we get the right medication at first. And I didn't. During this time, I was doing some uh, the things I regret very much. Um, I was promiscuous, very much, um, out a lot with a lot of different people. Um, I cheated. I was the person that others were using to cheat on somebody else with. Um, there were behaviors that I completely regret. And what I would do is it was these temporary moments of happiness where you tried to get that feeling that somebody liked you. you. You wanted to have that moment where somebody approved of you. Um, in in stand-up, it's, it's laughter and applause. In, in radio, it's, it's, it's people... Uh, coming up to you at your live uh, broadcast or calling in and saying, you know, uh, that they, they love what you're doing and stuff. And at night, it was dates. And every night, I went to bed alone and hating myself, completely hating myself. In the morning, I would look up in the mirror and not recognize the person I saw. It wasn't who I was. It, it wasn't. I, see, I believe, that, I believe that every single one of us has an inner child, the person that we were when life is anew to us, before the poisons and the toxins of our world kind of uh, try to uh, disillusion us and everything. We, we have this, uh, this innocent child, and I believe that that's what Christ sees in us uh, every time. And I couldn't see that anymore. T 
Today, I, I read, you know, Scripture about following Jesus. I was so far away from that. I would say that I was a Christian. If people asked, I would say I was a Christian. If somebody invited me to church, I would go. You know, I believed in Jesus. But my actions didn't show it. If you were to have met me then, you would not know that that person was this person. Um, I know just by the looks. Yeah, but uh, the actions was a person that was running from one thing to the other, just trying to get some sort of approval. And that led to long-term uh, tr attempts at long-term relationships, too. Building a family. I, I had a son at this time. I was a dad when I was doing this. And sometimes I would try to correct that uh, behavior by jumping into a relationship and then jumping to the altar and getting married. I'll take care of it. But I always ended up marrying the people that were trying to do the same thing that I was, and that was trying to get a, a quick fix out of something. We were all using each other. And it would end in divorce. Um, I know that I, I, some, some of the people that have been here uh, from the beginning kind of know a little bit about this story, but um, some of you may not. Your pastor's been divorced three times. Um, your pastor's done a lot of things that you should not do. Um, there was a time when I gave up on everything. And that's when I questioned whether or not to, to end it. So the medication that I was taking, the, 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 the solutions that I was trying to correct about self-worth were leading me down this brick wall after brick wall. And each time, it hurt. And every time that I went to sleep at night, I hated the person that I was. Hated. I found out that this, this, this cycle that I had of trying to self-medicate led down to more insecurities, more low self-esteem, so much more that the question of me being alive was questionable. I love the fact that we have kids here now. I love that. We have families and that are starting anew. And I, I pray, I pray that you know what love is and what it means to be loved. Because some, somehow along the line, I missed out on that a little bit. That's what Jesus is talking about in this parable. You can, say, you can say you follow Jesus, but unless you actually understand that love message, you're not going to get it. You're not going to understand it. And if you try to medicate yourself, if you try to build yourself up or, or try to uh, have a little bit of higher self-worth by going down the wrong roads, you're not going to get it. I was sacrificing every value, every moral, every every self-worth of ounce of respect and dignity that I ever had at the cost of trying to make myself feel worthy. And it wasn't until I actually fell flat on my butt that I had a moment, and it's hard to describe. I'm never going to get it right, but... I kind of call it my Paul mo moment. You know, the Apostle Paul was, was knocked on his, on his butt and he saw Jesus. And I feel like that's what kind of happened to me. I had this moment where I, 
It connected. Now, sadly, at this time, I had been going to church. I had been uh, getting more involved in church. To, to people, I was a model Christian. Behind the scenes, I wasn't. It took a couple more, more years. But I would like to say that the, the, there were seeds being planted and doors being opened once I started to step foot into a church. Once I started to see what other people, uh, their relationship with Jesus was starting to, to see. And I would understand that the, 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 the culture and the, the verbiage that some people were using was not the way that I was living. And so when I had a complete rock bottom experience, I had the knowledge and the wisdom of the others that I had met in the Christian circles of what Christ is all about. And that's what led me out of that. (laughs) It's funny, when uh, when I first started really praying and really experiencing uh, who Christ was. And, and I, I found myself uh, just in, in, engulfed in uh, reading and, and learning and, and inviting, you know, that's the old cliche of inviting Christ into my life. Well, that's what I was doing. I was living and breathing it. And I also told myself that I was going to be Paul, the apostle, meaning I was not going, I was going to be single the rest of my life because I was not going to hurt another human being. When you do things that hurt yourself, you do things that hurt others. There's no getting around that. And then years later, I met her. And I said, I'm going to be single the rest of my life. And she said, No, you're not. And ever since then, I've been doing exactly what she tells me to. <laughs> On our first date, I, uh, I tried to help her. Uh, she, uh, I tried to, to be the, the gallant hero and push, you know, uh, hit a stump, knocked her right on her chair, out of her chair. I did, yeah. Right on, in, in, on the cement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's when she, she knew it was love then, so... It's that connection that Christ is talking about in that parable. There are people that will say that they'll never be a Christian, that they don't believe and all of that kind of stuff. And Jesus is going to be going to the people and inviting the people that want to be part of this. But once you say that you want to be part of this, he's going to be reminding you that your actions can keep you from him. You can say that you're a Christian, but if you are continually doing naughty and bad things, you will be separated from him. It's not Jesus' choice. It's ours. By doing the behaviors, I was keeping Christ at bay and not wanting any of that love. By welcoming Christ, I put the other things at bay and understood what love was. And it changed me. It made me do something that I never thought I would ever do in my life. And that is this. <laughs> believe, I mean, there are people that walk around now that still can't believe that I'm doing this. And you know what? There are times I really want to stand on their side and say, I don't know why I'm doing it either. <laughs> this is nuts. But this is what happens when you welcome Christ, you, you start to live differently. You start to change things about you. You start to become a different person. And, and that's what I did. And that led me to other morals. Now I talk about Neighbors Church. The morals that I have, um, I believe in Uh, If you're in a relationship, that relationship is respectful and with one person. That's what I believe. I believe that love is an action as well as a feeling. I believe that Christ is that love. And that love means that I respect 
everyone. That I don't use people. That I don't cheat. That I love people who they are. It also makes me um, open that door to everyone. And to love people uh, as they are, for who they are. That's the respect. That's a, that's a moral thing. When we, when we talk about inclusion and all of this kind of stuff, we're not trying to make a, a political statement. We're not trying to, to, to fight another side. We're just saying that our morality says love, that Christ is love, and that's what we do. That's what we do. As long as I'm up here, that's what we're going to... You're, you're going to be hearing that every Sunday. Is that we're nothing unless we're loving each other. And some people will say, well, you know, but you're going against the Bible. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> they always do that at the end. <laughs> well, it's my morality that also makes me look at the scripture that we just read that mentions the word slave at least four times and say, my morals don't agree with that. So it does challenge what we are and what we do. I'm happy to say that I feel like I am now part of that wedding party now. That I am there now. I hope you do too. I haven't heard any gnashing of teeth yet. And I hope we don't. And I hope we continue to invite others to come to the banquet. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, help us to experience you. If we're chasing down terrible roads, if we're going where places that take us further from you, help, help to turn us around. Help us to understand that what makes us a Christian is by love. Accepting love, feeling loved, and loving others. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen.